So it's Friday, October 30th. And I've let the greenhouse uh, kind of self-regulate for the day. It's pretty chilly out there at the moment. I think it's like 34, something like that. Um, and while I don't have the secondary thermal mass rigged up to sensors yet, you can see on that top chart where the uh, system has been dumping heat, you can see where I did a manual takeover there and dumped extra heat into the secondary thermal mass tank and then uh, where it came back and uh, you can see all these squiggly lines here where it was basically dumping and turning on and off and, uh, and you can see my original stoke here early and heat production come up you can see the stove temp and the greenhouse temps and all come up and then you can see where I restoked it and uh, throttled it back and just let it run overnight relatively flat across the, the timeline there. And then you can see as that stoke ran out, this thermal mass starts tanking off pretty quickly because it's pretty cold out. So uh, tonight it's supposed to go down into the 20s, I think. Something like that. It's supposed to get pretty cold tonight uh, comparatively to what we've had. We got some snow out there today. And uh, I'm going to track this chart and uh, I'll just kind of give you a better idea of how, uh, how well the thermal mass regulates temperature. But uh, you can see already that it's, uh, it's managed well beyond uh, what any normal fire setup would manage by itself or stove setup would manage by itself. I'll just give you a shot of the snow out the window here. Okay, so part five in the series on build your own greenhouse uh, here on the Pharmacy Seeds Network. Uh, I want to dive into heating. Uh, I'm primarily going to discuss heating with wood as that is a natural and regenerative form of heat as a source uh, but I suppose I should touch on a few other topics as I have had comments and questions about other concepts and topics so let's start with wood heat actually let's back up and start with the whole concept of heat in general heating a greenhouse is very different from heating a home uh, a greenhouse has either glass or plastic as the majority of your walls at least a conventional greenhouse and I guess I should just pause and say in the future if I build another greenhouse or when I build another greenhouse because I certainly plan to at some point uh, I want to put my greenhouse set into the ground on a south facing slope biggest key features number one biggest thing to consider is Delta T what is Delta T Delta T is the difference between the temperature inside the greenhouse and the temperature outside the greenhouse. That is the delta or difference in temperature between inside and outside. If you know anything about thermodynamics, you know that the higher the temperature in the greenhouse and the lower the temperature outside, the faster heat loss happens through any given medium. And of course, if that medium has a greater incident greater capacity to insulate or what is known as a higher R value uh, then you have less heat loss through that unfortunately with greenhouse plastic you basically have an R value of like <laughs> one if it's even that it's really low double layer plastic definitely helps tremendously when I say double layer plastic I don't mean just two layers of plastic right against each other I mean a layer of plastic and an air gap and a layer of plastic and that's it. really important and I would say any greenhouse you're gonna build uh, you want to do that um, to the best of your ability uh, more air gap is better that's a little bit bigger airspace uh, don't go crazy because inside of the air gap you have convective currents where the inner plastic is warming the air inside of there and it's flowing up and circulating back down the outside where it's cold and flowing back up so there is some circulation so you don't want to create create a huge airspace in there but some airspace has a tremendous capacity to insulate 
Uh, this greenhouse was built originally with only one layer of plastic and then a second layer was added and uh, for budgeting reasons because I'm working on a shoestring or less budget I used uh, some styrofoam insulation that I had around and I just tacked it on with uh, those roofing uh, like you use for uh, holding down uh, tar paper those and screws just to create that airspace and, uh, that gave me a two inch space between them. Now over time as the wind has beaten on the greenhouse and such uh, those some of those have broken down so not all of our air spaces are separated anymore so there's places where the two pieces of plastic hit and touch each other and actually this is a great opportunity to show you that. So this spot right here is a spot where the outside plastic and the inside plastic are touching each other and you can immediately visually see the difference because where there's two separate layers of plastic and there's an air gap there's no condensation happening there because the temperature of this plastic is much warmer than the temperature of the plastic down here that is touching the outside plastic because they're right together they're conducting that cold that you know that cold right through and because they're conducting that cold right through now we have a place that is much much colder and I wish I had a thermal imaging camera on me I don't but uh, my friend Matt uh, has a thermal imaging camera attachment for his phone, and maybe I can get him to come over here one of these evenings, and uh, we'll do we'll do a thermal imaging shot of the greenhouse, and then you really have a good representation of what um, what's really going on here thermally. But um, my point is, is this is what single layer plastic will do, and initially when I first built the greenhouse, uh, the plastic actually on the really cold nights, the plastic would actually not only condensate, but you'd actually have ice frozen on the plastic. And so you're kind of warm in the greenhouse, but there's ice all around you on the wall. So that's why that two layer thing is important. And that goes back to that delta T concept, that difference in temperature. You put that airspace in there, and now your delta T between the inside and the airspace is one delta T, and then again, another one between the airspace inside and the outside. I hope I've explained that concept in a way you can understand it. All right, so what you want to do, like in any good, in any efficiently designed structure uh, that you want to maintain any temperature in, whether you want to maintain cool or warm, uh, is provide as much insulation as possible. So, uh, a few things that you should consider. Uh, number one, when you build a greenhouse, uh, if you're going to build above ground, I would say go around the outside of the greenhouse and do like you were going to pour footings and dig down two feet uh, and you may pour footings anyway if you're doing concrete for your foundation I'd recommend that for lots of reasons we'll get into some of those other reasons in another part of the series but uh, I would say go down two feet put this at least two inch styrofoam insulation down if you can afford it, afford it put four inch styrofoam insulation down Put an insulation down that mice won't chew on, that won't degrade in moisture, down the list of you know environmental reasons, right? So something like two-inch styrofoam is great. Go down at least two feet, and that'll help prevent that cold temperature from coming in through the ground through what's called conduction, and actually cooling the soil in the greenhouse on the floor, and then that affects the floor end up being cold, right? When the floor is cold, now your plants sitting on the floor are picking that cold up through conduction, and they're getting their feet cold. Now your soil is cold. Now your biology can't act as well. Your plants are not comfortable. You see where I'm going here. So you're trying to prevent that. So uh, insulation around the bases. Uh, I would say any uh, if you can do this, build it so your greenhouse is south wall facing to the sun if you're in the north. Obviously, if you're on the other hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, you'd want to flip this. You'd want to be uh, uh, facing, facing your sunlight windows to the north and your back wall protected. Uh, I would say if you're going to build above ground, uh, everything, say, from even the ridge, you might come back one more, one more step. Uh, but everything in that back part of that should be an insulated shell. There's no reason to have that open to cold weather. Uh, you do get some sunlight uh, reflected back through. It's actually amazing how much light comes back through, but the, the loss that you're going to take thermally uh, definitely will not make up for 
the gains that you'll take in light. You're better off to make that up with supplemental lighting or some other light collection method. We can talk about some of the complexities of that in another part of the series. Um, but basically you want to do everything you can to insulate and mitigate heat loss off the bat. That's the number one thing. Once you've done that, then you want to design a heating system that is efficient for distribution of heat throughout the entire greenhouse. <clears throat> you may, in your design, consider making different climates within the greenhouse. Say if you're growing colder crops like cabbages or brassicas or uh, lettuces or something like that. Uh, in my case, this end of the greenhouse here, away from the stove, is cooler. I would grow something like that more on this end. If you want stuff that's more tropical, you want to put that closer to your heat source or to your thermal mass storage tanks. Oh, and by the way, that reminds me. Uh, one important point I missed when I was out in the greenhouse and I'm sitting here editing. Uh, your heat source ideally would be in the middle of your greenhouse so that your radiation is, you know, going out in equal directions. Uh, mine was put in the end of the greenhouse because of the way the greenhouse was designed initially. Um, mostly so that it would not be in the way of getting up and down the aisles and so that it would not be so close to plants that they would be burned by the stove's radiation when it's running hot. Uh, ideally what you would do is place your stove or heat source in the middle of your greenhouse and then surround that with thermal mass that would absorb that radiative impact so the plants would not be uh, you know damaged by it and at the same time it would capture maximum heat into your thermal mass it, again taking advantage of that uh, delta t concept except using it to capture heat rather than trying to prevent heat loss so uh, just some things to consider in amongst heating greenhouses um, yeah, just an extra point I wanted to make, uh, extra clear. <laughs> um, that's important. So, uh, so the big, the big takeaway from this part of the video is Delta T. Anything you can do to, uh, to retain heat is number one. After you've done everything you can to most efficiently retain heat, then you want to move on to step two and produce heat effectively and distribute it effectively. <clears throat> Let's talk about that as it applies to my greenhouse. So in my greenhouse, I'm sure by now you've figured out that I use wood for heat. I like wood for lots of reasons. Uh, one, it's a really, really cheap fuel source, at least here on my farm. I don't have to uh, pay for wood to be delivered. I can go out back with my tractor, drop a standing dead tree or even a standing live tree of certain types. and. Uh, you know, I can basically go back there in half an hour, drop a couple of trees, rig them up with the chain and the tractor, skid them up here. I got firewood for a couple of days to a week to two weeks, depending on weather and conditions. Uh, so that's a really excellent heat source. Uh, downside of that, it's hard to automate. Um, but you can buffer that out using the thermal mass like I'm doing here. And like we talked about in the previous section, uh, part four of this series, we talked a little bit about thermal management. Um, so there's lots of ways to take advantage of that. You can produce a tremendous amount of heat with a good wood stove, or even better yet, a rocket furnace. Uh, this stove here is very similar to a rocket furnace. It's not quite a rocket furnace. It doesn't have that rocket furnace riser loop set up. Uh, but it's pretty efficient and uh, it produces a tremendous amount of heat. You'll see that I have this aluminum heat shield here. This is, uh, this is here for the sole purpose of pre preventing the radiated heat coming off of this stove from literally almost baking everything over here, including the Raspberry Pi. Before I had this, uh, this shield here, the Raspberry Pi CPU temperature would climb right out when the stove climbed out and I'd have to run extra cooling to keep it cool. Obviously I could put it in a better place, but for now, this is what I had to do. Now that heat shield does not prevent the heat from going into the greenhouse, it just prevents the radiation. You should understand, there's two types of uh, heat that come off of the stove. There's convective, where the stove is hot and the air comes by it, warms, rises, you know, loops out as it cools, it'll settle back down, come back around. This is very uh, beneficial for the greenhouse because it's not only doing it uh, in this direction, but also cool air coming from over there comes to the stove, warms up, rises, 
flows back over here. So there's these constant convective loops in here that help move air without the use of fans. That's very uh, beneficial from an efficiency standpoint. Oh boy, and I think I forgot to mention conduction in there as well. So there's uh, radiation, convection, and conduction are the three main ways to transfer heat and uh, convection is pretty straightforward, or conduction is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, it's conducted along uh, whatever material it is. Some conductors are better than others. Obviously something like copper would conduct heat very quickly, something like wood would be slower, and something like styrofoam would be even slower. Um, certainly there's a wide range of materials to consider in that regard. Anyway, I just wanted to make the point so, uh, so no one thought I missed it. And then, of course, the other kind of heat is radiative heat. Uh, that's heat that basically moves like a wave. It moves in straight lines. If you were to take a flashlight, like my headlight, and shine it, heat, radiated heat, basically works the same way. And it radiates, and it strikes a surface, and it heats that surface. Uh, from a human perspective, if you feel radiated heat, uh, it feels kind of like pins and needles, uh, warm pins and needles, for lack of a better way to describe it. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> what else? So the wood stove is a fantastic way to produce heat. Uh, that said, uh, you know, having to come out here and stoke a wood stove all the time can take up a lot of time and energy. Uh, so I added this thermal mass system pretty quickly uh, to help capture the heat and then store it and release it slowly over time. I talked about that in the part four of this series, but uh, that's a very handy tool. I'll just uh, let you have a look inside here. Uh, we got some uh, fresh maple and cherry logs in there. Um, they're pretty well seasoned, these are. I do sometimes burn green wood in here. That's not the best source. I don't recommend anyone who's not familiar with wood burning stoves, different types of wood and what wood you can and what wood you can't and creosote and fire hazards and all those other little subtle pieces. I don't recommend you burn green wood. I do it and I can get away with it. Uh, I prefer not to, but uh, sometimes it's what's available, and uh, and I can kind of you know fill in the space on uh, on things, on uh, you know wood shortages or whatever. Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, I, I touched on wood heat a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure if I've covered everything I wanted to cover about it, but I think I, I got the general idea across as far as heating. Um, so I did have some other questions about it, uh, about heating a greenhouse. Uh, I've had all sorts of comments on my uh, channel over the f past few years. People asking about, uh, you know, what about geothermal? What about compost heat? What about just using thermal mass? Um, so I'll touch on those briefly. Uh, geothermal is an option. Uh, there's a couple different types of geothermal. Uh, typically geothermal is done where you, uh, well, if you're really lucky and you sit near, uh, you know, near volcanic activity or something, oftentimes you can drill down, or in some, time, some places you don't even have to drill down, and you can put, uh, you know, coils in the ground that pick up the natural heat from the ground and uh, pump that heat to your greenhouse. That's really effective and nice to have. Most of us don't live in a place where there's volcanic activity. Partially, I'm kind of glad not to be too close to a volcano. Um, but so that's an option uh, but typically geothermal at least in our area I used to work for a civil engineer and land surveyor And we did some surveying engineering jobs uh, for some pretty rich clients who had geothermal put in. I know one we did out in Ankrum, we drilled 12 geothermal wells out there. And uh, they, were, they were expensive to drill, expensive to put in. I don't remember exactly what the cost was, but I'm pretty sure it was a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, to drill those wells and put in that geothermal system. And at the end of the day, here in New York, uh, if you go down in the ground, depending on where you are in New York, 
the ground will be between anywhere between 47 and 55 degrees which uh, may seem cold to you but there's still latent heat there that can be extracted and basically all geothermal is is taking that heat that's in that uh, water or ground usually you extract it through the water you pump the water up and you run it through a heat exchanger and the heat exchanger extracts the heat and the water going back down into the well is now even colder than when it came up uh, I think that runs around 60 percent efficiency if I remember correctly uh, definitely we should check my numbers on that but um, so it basically works like a refrigerator where you have a, a cold loop and a hot loop uh, except uh, in this case it's a little bit different because you're 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 not trying to keep something cold you're trying to keep something warm but that same concept works we use a heat pump to extract the heat and so that takes electrical energy input and one of the things that I wanted to do with this greenhouse was make it as grid independent as possible uh, and that means you know not having to depend on electrical energy to heat it so geothermal is an option but it's a it's very expensive and B it, there is still an energy input cost uh, at least in most areas unless you're fortunate enough to have other uh, you know fortunate enough to have like uh, better temperatures better uh, conditions available to you for geothermal uh, that doesn't mean that you couldn't build a geothermal based greenhouse with a well system and then use solar power to drive those geothermal pumps but you're gonna sink a ton of money in to do it and the question is what's your ROI what's your return on investment are you ever gonna make that back well you gotta grow an awful lot of plants to make that back so uh, so I, it's an option it's a possibility I would not say it's a great one all right another option that's available uh, is uh, compost using compost to heat greenhouses now that's pretty effective and uh, pretty simplistic basically what you do is you take a, an area and you designate it for a compost pile could be in your greenhouse could be outside your greenhouse depends on how you're setting it up but basically as that uh, as that organic material decays it produces heat you can put coil you know coil loops through it to pick up that heat they don't necessarily have to be copper they could be black poly pipe or PEX tubing or garden hose or you know whatever you have available um, you don't have to have a super high efficiency of transfer you just make more coils if you need to uh, to pick up heat more efficiently um, that does work I've seen several models of that uh, in fact there's a there was a great experiment that was done in Massachusetts I think I think it was under USDA uh, there's a whole PDF document on it. They did an experiment uh, with something like that and they were actually capturing the nitrogen from the compost and injecting that into the soil. They were using an air loop system and they were looping the uh, heat from the compost into the greenhouse and before it went into the greenhouse they were piping that air in through the soil so that the nitrogen became available to the plants and they actually took a nutritional gain for the plants from it as well. That was a very efficient system, uh, but it's very complex, and if you fail to balance nitrogen correctly, you can end up killing your plants, and you could certainly make yourself really sick because uh, you should not be breathing nitrogen. Uh, you know, you ever have that really strong ammonia smell come to you out of compost or out of chicken manure or something? There you go. That's what you're talking about, and uh, I, I can guarantee you don't want to walk in your greenhouse and just about pass out from ammonia. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean that this isn't a way to do things. It's a great way to do things if you have a tremendous amount of organic material available to you or you can get it shipped in. Uh, certainly you could have something like wood chips brought in and then add a nitrogen source to it like chicken manure or uh, cow manure or something like that. Uh, you know, that's a great way to do it. Uh, now these are concepts that I haven't had time to explore or try. They're all on my list of things I'd like to play with, but you know, there's only so much time in a lifetime and only so much budget to dedicate and what I have works for now. Uh, let's see, uh, other options, uh, you know, people say what about using solar, uh, what about using solar heat collectors? Uh, solar heat collectors are an option. Uh, here in New York we do get quite a few cloudy days and at the end of the day you're only getting about a thousand watts per meter squared of collector area uh, 
and that's you know that's maximum value that assumes of course that you're capturing all that heat at 100 percent efficiency i can tell you in any solar collector uh, on the market today uh, you're probably not going to get 100 percent efficiency you might touch close to it but you're going to pay an awful lot of money for those solar collectors i do have a 12 foot by 4 foot uh hot water heater solar collector vacuum type that was given to me by a friend of mine and I do want to incorporate that in the system here at some point but uh, when I started to do some of the design work to make that happen uh, I decided to do some quick uh, BTU calculation math on it and it looks like that'll only yield me in the winter time that'll only yield me about 10 to 15,000 BTUs per day in full sunlight assuming I can keep that panel aimed perpendicular to the sunlight throughout the day so now in addition to uh, you know in addition to building the panel setting up the circulation system managing freezing cooling heating all those engineering pieces of that the other problem that you have is now you have to keep the panel perpendicular if you want to maintain efficiency if you don't do that you'll have even less than 10 or 15 thousand BTUs for a 32 square foot area so uh, from my perspective that's not the most efficient heat production way to do it. You'll notice here on my charts, let's just take a look at that quick. You'll notice here on my charts, oh, I don't have the BTU chart up. Well, I'll insert a screenshot here and you'll see the BTUs. Uh, th this thermal mass is capable, capable of about a max. If I take it up to 212 degrees, I think it'll hold like 40,000 or 45,000 BTUs. So, uh, you know, 40 or 45,000 BTUs just in this pot. And you figure if that panel can only give you 10 or 15,000 BTUs, what, uh, you know, what real gain do you have? I got through a lot of heat here. That 275 gallon IBC tote that was in here was capable I think at 160 degrees was my max temperature on that that could store 275,000 BTUs um, with all the thermal masses that I had combined in here last winter I think the max I ever touched was like 150 to 175,000 BTUs in storage that was enough to get me through the overnight but you know if you do the math on how many panels you need at 10 or 15,000 BTUs a piece and you're only going to get that when you get sunlight uh, you know it just doesn't work out economically efficiently so uh, so solar is not a bad option I would say if you want to use solar to heat your greenhouse the better place to invest your money would be into investing your money into a larger greenhouse space that gives you a couple advantages one you're collecting that heat directly to the greenhouse and it can be stored in your thermal mass in the greenhouse or managed in another way inside the greenhouse and two the bigger the greenhouse you build the more efficient it is on heat uh, it's just a, an equation of how how much uh, radiative surface you have versus how much thermal mass area there is contained inside of the insulated area which is the greenhouse um, so I think I've touched on a few things here uh, let's see we covered uh, wood heat compost um, and uh, and geothermal uh, I know people have mentioned or asked you know why don't you just throw a furnace in here or why don't you just throw uh, a propane heater in here and I can tell you I <laughs> I never did that because I did the math on that first and I knew that I did not want a massive propane or oil heating bill and I know commercial farmers who have furnaces in their greenhouses and all they do is complain about the fuel cost and how they don't make any money with the greenhouse because they put all that money into fuel cost up front and then if the furnace fails <laughs> goodbye I know a farmer who has uh, who has several greenhouses uh, right here in Red Hook and uh, they're pretty large and he grew tomatoes in them one one winter under supplemental lighting running the furnace and he had one night where the furnace didn't kick on everything froze in the greenhouse and he lost it all and so that is the harsh reality of it and and that's another big reason to put to build in thermal masses even if you did a furnace in your greenhouse I would still say use thermal mass because then if your furnace fails at least you have enough heat in your thermal masses to prevent freezing overnight and your plants are protected so there's a lot of advantages to this this thermal mass thing I know I bang on about it and on about it and on about it well that's because it's important it's very valuable um, I think I've covered 
The majority of the stuff I want to cover in this part of the series, I touched on a t couple of different heating sources. I touched on the Delta T concept. That's very important if you're going to design a greenhouse. And like I said, do everything you can to mitigate heat loss up front in your design. That's the first thing you want to look at. Once you've done that, then you look at how you're going to heat that actual space. Um, so uh, I think I'm going to cut this off for now. Uh, this is part five of the series, Build Your Own Greenhouse, here at the Pharmacy Seeds Network. I hope you found this interesting or informative. Again, if you have questions or comments, please do so down below. I'll be glad to address those either in a response video or in the next part of the series or some other part of the series as we go along. We're only just getting started on some of the logistics of building your own greenhouse and managing uh, you know, temperatures and plant comfort and all those pieces. Anyway, thanks for watching, um, and I hope you'll like, share, and subscribe. And hey, don't forget to check out my show on Truth Frequency Radio, Comrades in Farms, also uh, simulcast here on YouTube. Uh, that's Tuesday nights, 9 p.m. Pacific, Wednesday, Wednesday 12 a.m. Eastern Time. And uh, last week I had uh, Brad from Grow the Farm Up, who's a nutritional who's a regenerative uh, farmer out in Nebraska, large scale. That was an excellent conversation. The week before that, I had Justin Goodearth on. Uh, Justin is a licensed cannabis grower in Oregon. We talked about Korean natural farming and all of those subtleties around that. That was an excellent conversation. And actually in episode three, I had Jim and Jessica from Green Dream Project. Those guys are homesteaders out in the desert in Arizona. That was an excellent conversation as well. Don't forget to check those out if you haven't checked them out. I thank you for watching the Pharmacy Seeds Network. I've babbled on long enough and hope we'll see you in the next part of the series.